Great people um, <laughs> is uh, a good friend of mine, Rogelio. We uh, we were in the same lab in grad school together, and uh, Chris Martins, who is also involved uh, uh, in my in my dissertation while I was at NC State. So I know them both really well. Um, and I saw the title of this talk, and I thought it sounded like the coolest thing, especially with one of their co-authors, Neil Cohn. So if you uh, if you ha if you haven't got a chance to read the abstract of this. Uh, it, it's really enticing, I found, and uh, they're two really great people to work with. Um, so please, uh, you know, I'm sure Rahelia will hold your attention during this. And if you have any questions, again, post, uh, post them in the Slack channel, hashtag talk dash Mart Martins. Um, Rahel, uh, she, she's not here to present right now, but um, Rahelia, go ahead and take it away. Okay, I will try to not mess this up in a way that, you know, not betray that I'm not a computer. I am a computer scientist, I swear. Um, let's see. So I believe I have to share a screen with a specific window. Let's see. Share. Okay. Can everyone see that? Is that visible? I don't know. Is it visible? Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so as Adam was saying, uh, my name is Rogelio Cardona Rivera. I'm currently an assistant professor in the School of Computing and the Entertainment Arts and Engineering program at the University of Utah. I'm presenting on behalf of my colleagues and uh, co-conspirators, Chris Martins and Neil Cohn, and the title of the talk, uh, Visual Narrative Engine, a Model of the Visual Narrative Parallel Architecture. So this talk is intentionally designed to be at a very high level because if you want the details, I am happy to direct you to the paper or talk to you offline. But I really want everyone to just walk away with the concept of what's going on here. Okay, this is you primarily- can start, You can swap your displays, I think by hitting the screen. Uh, oh. The, the button in the upper right hand corner, I think will do it. Keep going to the right with your cursor. Oh. Uh -huh. that one. There we go, yes, thank you, see? Um, great. I swear I am a computer scientist. Um, okay, so this is really motivated by the question, you know, how is it that people understand visual narrative? Okay, so I can't see the chat, um, but I will give a million imaginary points uh, for the first person who writes a coherent uh, interpretation of what's going on. And it, what's interesting here is that there are no words. You're just looking at a sequence of images that are conveying something. Um, ultimately, what we are interested in, in understanding is how is it that this sequence of images can convey any kind of information that is coherent? And clearly the juxtaposition of images suggests meaning, but it's interesting because there is something coherent that you are processing as this goes on. Uh, fun fact, as we wrote in the paper, um, I originally thought that this was uh, the Hulk. It turns out that this is a character, I think from the Marvel Universe, uh, Savage Dragon. Uh, but yeah, it just goes to show that errors in processing can happen. Um, okay, so I will trust that someone wrote a coherent narrative in chat. Uh, I, I hope that they're good because I always enjoy seeing what people interpret. But ultimately, we don't know what that process is. And that's kind of the, the, the punchline up front is that we don't know what the process is that underlies visual story understanding. And in fact, I'll say that we don't know what underlies story understanding in general. And this might seem like a controversial statement, but bear with me. Um, you know, AI is broadly functionalist. And by that, I mean that thus far, we've made great advances in modeling story understanding, but it's functionalist, fun functionalist in the sense that it assumes that minds and machines only need the equivalent in terms of inputs and outputs for the machine to be a good model of the mind. And that conflates automated task completion with simulation of human processes used for task completion. And those are very different different things. Now, ultimately what these systems are, are rational hypotheses of what's going on in the mind 
as it processes stories. And that's okay. Uh, some people are put off by the term rational and I will, I guess, offer an apology. Uh, human unconstrained architectures for story understanding. So these systems might be motivated to understand what's going on inside the mind, but because we don't have direct access to it, it's a functionalist hypothesis. It basically says, well, this is one way that we could do it. And until we have a better way to figure it out, this will do. And this is broadly what we see today in the state of story understanding AI. In terms of knowledge lean story understanding that depends primarily on statistical techniques, they really rely on document analysis methods. And primarily what they see as story understanding is plot extraction or, or, or plot information extraction. So we can, for example, find narrative event schemas like the Chambers and Jurassic work, um, or we can find uh, stereotypical goal situations such as, you know, one of my colleagues at, at Utah, Ellen Ryloff, uh, recently published a, a way to, to extract prototypical goals associated with locations, for example. Another area of work, which is not really story understanding, but kind of it's, I guess, conceptual dual, uh, story generation from a knowledge rich perspective. And this is, you know, narrative theoretic heuristic search planning. And by that, I mean, it's planning based approaches that generate stories with constraints on the structure that's codified as part of the planning process and the constraints that basically make sure that the ultimate plan that results is narrative theoretic or is tellable or believable as a story. And then another approach that was actually mentioned today, uh, so neurosymbolic approaches, and this kind of combines understanding and generation, but really it's to extract common sense reasoning as evidenced by performance benchmarks on tasks like the closed task, for example, understanding you know, what sentence must follow as a kind of inferencing mechanism based on what I have seen thus far. Um, or a question answering task. Can this system extract enough information for common sense reasoning to answer questions about the thing it just processed? And again, these are rational hypotheses or human unconstrained models of story understanding. Now, despite that, there was remarkable progress on story understanding and I'll cover it very incompletely, but just to give you a sense of, of the impact this had. Um, so by the 1990s, uh, work on specifically knowledge-rich story understanding or symbolic-based approaches to story understanding, we knew the following. Uh, Walensky and others uh, demonstrated that people predict what goals and subsequent actions uh, will follow the observed actions by characters in a kind of plan recognition-like process. Um, Norvig actually showed that scripts are very important for generating knowledge-based inferences about things that aren't necessarily depicted in a plot. Uh, Eric Mueller talked about how spatial temporal reasoning constrains the spaces of inferences that you could make that are consistent with what you've observed. Uh, uh, Wendy Lanier talked about how means ends and hierarchical reasoning, so causal reasoning and, and intentional or purposive reasoning contribute the most to a person's memory of a story. So that reasoning process through which you understand stories at a, at a causal structural level and an intentional structural level actually make it so that those are the things that you anchor on to get the gist of the story that you later tell. And uh, Black and Bauer, who are actually like psychologists, um, actually demonstrated that a model of hierarchical problem solving is key for inferencing and understanding. Um, and then, you know, a homage to uh, Patrick Winston, who demonstrated through the Genesis storytelling or story understanding system, that it's actually possible to combine all of these individual processes in a principled manner. Um, what's striking to me is that post the 1990s, because this work kind of died out, um, I, I shouldn't say died out, but I guess it lost traction uh, post the 1990s. Uh, it turns out, you know, the survey says that they were actually all right about those concepts. So there's a ton of evidence across uh, story psychology literature that said, yes, those are all key processes, but the functionalist hypotheses were not right about the way in which we perform that reasoning. But still, for not having a, a super extensive, you know, cadre of researchers looking at story psychology, 
it's pretty impressive that you know, they were all right conceptually. Uh, fun fact, neurosymbolic approaches are actually discovering the same. So it turns out that structured representations of events, of goals, of characters, and of scripts actually help statistical methods outperform non-trivial baselines on benchmark tasks. So I'm happy to point you to this literature, but it's really striking how we are rediscovering or at least converging on plan-like structures that actually do help statistical methods reason. Uh, another fun fact, uh, the 80s knew what they were talking about. So uh, Gordon, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Brown and Black talked about how that hierarchical problem solving theory, uh, while it demonstrated that it could explain some of the data that they were observing in experiments, uh, was deficient in the sense of it's not spelling out the moment to moment process by which the reader arrives at those representational products. And ultimately, that's what I was talking about at the very beginning, which is saying that we still don't know at a process level, at a computationally precise process level, what is it that's actually manipulating all those structures. Okay, so going back, remarkable progress in story understanding from knowledge rich approaches. Uh, and that article by Eric Mueller, uh, linked below, actually had a really, has a really good uh, survey of, of, of those approaches. Okay, so story psychology has offered several process level accounts. Um, and in fact, several of those accounts, and this is a shameless plug, uh, I uh, basically summarized in this paper that was published in the 2019 Spring Symposium on Story Enabled Intelligence, that basically just compiles them all into one uh, Need, need to digest format uh, to see what is it that actually story psychology has evidence regarding how we process stories. Um, but ultimately, there's a problem in that literature, and that's that uh, they're too abstract. So the stories, sorry, the, the, the theories that describe story sense making or story understanding are at such high level that, in fact, there are several competing theories, at least like seven different theories that talk about how is it that we're all processing this information at a, at a process level. And they're all consistent with specific accounts and they haven't been reconciled. So there's now a problem that there are multiple ways to make sense of the data that we're observing and there's no principled way to make progress. So ultimately, this is where the paper has its soapbox moment. Uh, we must bring these together. And ultimately, this is talking about what uh, Vieto and Rancioni talked about in their paper that's linked there, which is to develop cognitively plausible structural models. So these systems then are based on a more constrained equivalence between computer procedures and the cognitive processes that they prefer to model. And ultimately, that's one way that they argue and that we argue is a way to make progress on this problem of understanding at a process level, what is it about the way that we're processing stories that contributes to our understanding. Um, this paper was a kind of existence proof to just describe that, uh, or just, just to show that we can describe story understanding procedures mechanically. Now, we don't present a, a, an exhaustive theory of how to do this, but basically we just, we point to the things that are evident must be the case as a hypothesis to continue to explore. And that's ultimately what the point of this paper is. But I think, I think at, a, at a more foundational level, something that we're, 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 we believe is that we may need to epistemologically rely on simulation. So this next image may seem completely random. Uh, but it may as well describe what the state of this research is at the moment. So with a very small modification, I can promise you that it'll make sense. Uh, here we go. So we know at a process level when we have a narration, so some text or a film or even a video game or a comic sequence, um, it comes in through our, our perceptual uh, reasoning and we are able to discretize that narration on the basis of what's called continuity prediction failures. So basically, as we are perceiving a narrative artifact, we discretize it into its constituent event structure based on our failure to predict continuity in the events that we're perceiving. So ultimately, when there is a shift 
in a specific dimension of information. So for example, in film, a cut is a spatial temporal shift usually. And so when that cut happens, it basically is a cue to the mind to archive the current event and instantiate a new event model with which to integrate incoming information. And that process continues and that's how we build events. Fun fact, when you are walking through a doorway in your house, the door frame is a spatial boundary, which explains why you have impoverished memory when you enter into a room. It's not just you, it's actually a human trait to forget what you were about to do when you enter into a room. It also happens when you open the fridge, uh, fun fact. So these continuity prediction failures help predict how we discretize a narration into an event structure, but that's all we know. What happens next or what happens beyond the so-called event horizon, and I swear I didn't make that up, that's actually, there's a paper called the event horizon model. Um, what happens beyond the event horizon is anybody's guess. And in fact, there is a certain sense of, we, are, we may not be able to epistemologically determine what happens and we may need to rely on simulation to just posit theories because other methods through which we can study the brain, so for example, fMRI, it's a functional magnetic resonance image, which tells you, you know, what, what's, what lights up, but not necessarily what's going on. Okay, so going back to this question of, well, how is it that we actually process this comic? Um, and ultimately, again, we're trying to come up with a computational model that can represent the structural and reasoning constraints that have been identified in the psychology literature. So we took to a model that was developed by our third co-author, Neil Cohn, which is the Parallel Interfacing Narrative Semantics Model, or PINs. So this is the process model, or this is the reasoning side of the architecture. And it basically says that we are processing graphic structure simultaneously along two channels, basically the narrative processing, which corresponds to syntax, and the semantic processing that corresponds to uh, the, the grammar of the, of, of the, of the events, right? So that this is now our mental modeling of what's going on. And ultimately what we wanna be able to describe just at a, at a quick summary is, give me a computational architecture that can implement this process. Because as you can see, there are interfaces defined between all of these individual components. So there's narrative categories that access semantic memory. There's also a component of prediction. So inferencing is a key process of story understanding. Uh, and there's also mental model updating or situation model updating, which goes through updates that are based on prediction. So that we predict what's gonna happen next, or we have to infer something that must have happened between two utterances in discourse. And it also happens based on structure. So I know because I have seen several James Bond films that when the camera pans to a specific location, which is a grammatical motion, right? It, that there's no, not necessarily something about the, the content being depicted. Um, that is going to result in something that's relevant in the future. And so it cues uh, an inference that might happen and I maintain that tacitly in my mind. Okay, so this is the processing side. This representational, sorry, this reasoning architecture depends on a representation, which was also developed by Neil Cohn, which is called the visual narrative grammar. And so this is the, the, the KR of the KRR, right? So this is the, the actual structures of, of knowledge that are taken as semantic primitives. Um, so there is the graphic structure, which we can represent verbatim, and we do have access to some of that, but primarily the processing happens at the grammatical level on the narrative structure and at the semantic level at the event structure. And so I won't specify all the details here, but basically what we're doing is as we're processing these com th th this comic sequence uh, panel by panel, we revise these models in our heads uh, in anticipation of well-formed structure that guides our understanding. So here you have a six panel sequence in the narrative structure, which is the syntax side. The syntax says, well, a well-formed or canonical narrative arc is one that has an initial event, a prolong maybe a prolongation, uh, a peak event, and a release. And in fact, the, the theory of visual narrative grammar says that the only really key element that you can have that you need to have is the peak, right? So that's why you can have single panel comics as long as you can infer the rest of the structure. But in terms of like well-formed structure, you need to have at least the peak. 
And so this also has a corresponding uh, analogous structure at the event level where a well-formed semantic structure is an event has a preparation, a head, and a coda. So this is based on Jackendorf's theory of constructive grammar that th this kind of event structure actually happens not just in, in for example, narrative, it also happens in, in music. Um, there's a kind of grammatical structure at the level of, of the music's meaning. Um, and here you can see uh, in the subscripts of all the elements across there, uh, which panels they're referring to uh, with reference to the last element of the VNG, which is a spatial referential structure. And so what this structure is telling us is, well, the way that we're actually making sense of all these panels in a coherent way is to build up basically a unifying structure that allows us to say, ah, the character in panel one is the same one in panel two, um, and they are connected through specifically a spatial context, which is a dominant form of reasoning, like uh, Mueller was saying, is, uh, spatial reasoning constrains how you, how you process narrative. Um, so this is the V and G. This is basically the representation. Uh, and to go back for a second, uh, this is the, the reasoning. And together, they form an engine of sorts. So the V and G plus the pins model is the visual and narrative parallel architecture. Uh, and the guiding question is, well, can we describe procedures to match these interfaces that are imagined across this kind of structure, right? So this is the first step in just attempting to describe at a computational level all of these different processes. Okay, so I will quickly go over the, the elements of the model because again, I'm happy to talk about it in more depth and you can read the paper. Um, so let's talk about the first element of this that we focused on. So we're focusing on specifically in this paper on semantic processing, um, trying to posit representations that must exist. So the, at the, the semantic memory, one way that we can talk about it is in terms of scene graphs, because they tie into the graphic structure and they help build the semantic model of what is being depicted. Um, so this is a representation from computer vision where you have basically a directed graph where the nodes correspond to the objects of a scene uh, and they are linked together with a bunch of uh, basically tag information that can get refined over time. So in panel one, we have the dragon character, the savage dragon, uh, who is currently in a relationship at this uh, undefined epsilon, because without looking at panel two and panel three, it is basically the environment catch-all variable. Uh, at panel two, we can detect that maybe actually the, the, the character is actually falling, so we can unify those structures through spatial referential reasoning. Um, and then we can say, well, actually the dragon is, uh, in panel two, the dragon is at the air, uh, the dragon is falling in panel two. Uh, and then in the last panel, you can see that the, the, the graph just keeps getting bigger uh, as it elaborates that information. So that's the prolongation that was happening uh, earlier. And so these bounding boxes basically are the grounding of the symbols that represent the, 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 the structure of the panel uh, to the actual phonological symbols in terms of lines, shapes, and action lines and, and colors that actually are depicting the narrative structure. Okay, so that's on the access side, the scene graphs. And then on the updating side, so we had the, the, the situation model can be well described by HTN plan. So we know that the event structure has this kind of hierarchical quality to them. And so a, a reasonable hypothesis is, well, maybe HTN plans can serve as the semantic, uh, a computational semantic model of a situation model. Um, so if you're not familiar with HTN, so their hierarchical task network is a representation of automated planning. And this is, you can imagine as a HTN parse of the comic sequence. So as we are reading this comic, we are building this HTN-like graphic, uh, HTN-like structure that gets refined with each panel. And ultimately that is the, the semantic meaning of the narrative. It's the, 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 the plan or the HDN plan that represents the plot. So one thing that's encouraging about this is that through prior work of my own at Disney Research, those representations of scene graphs and planning are actually compatible. So you can imagine that this, this is an image taken from uh, that paper that was published at AID uh, in 2016, that you can straightforwardly convert this scene graph representation into a predicate logic uh, representation, a descriptive logic actually, so it's actually pretty efficiently computable. And the, the, this can then be posed as part of the planning operators to describe the event sequence. 
So it's not strict classical HTN, which has not necessarily defined like preconditions and effects, uh, but it's like more modern hierarchical planning formalisms that actually can reason about both method decomposition and preconditions and effects. Okay, so this is how it all comes together. And again, I'm not going to go into a ton of detail because you can look at the paper, but ultimately you can see that just looking at the first event on the, on the left-hand side, there's a launch event that happens uh, over the, the, the character dragon, um, which basically suggests that um, the, the, the dragon was somewhere, right? So if we have this representation of a launch event, you are launched from something, then that will basically create an inference for you that, ah, that the explosive, there was something that launched you and po potentially if you have access to knowledge, there was an explosive that did so. And so that's knowledge that can then be inferred and then added to the situation as the, the narrative progresses. And ultimately this is, this is how we want to approach this process of saying, ah, these are representations that could actually represent the, the, the posited semantic primitives in the minds of story consumers. Uh, but then the question becomes, ah, so we have these events, what is the actual bridge? And there are many different hypotheses that you can, you can posit. So the open question of what's the bridge? Well, I mean, HTNs are a hierarchical planning representation. So is it, is it planning? Is it plan recognition? Is it both? Um, ultimately, I will leave the, the discussion there because that's as far as we've gotten with this paper. Um, that open question is what's guiding our current research. And again, that research is guided by the desire to understand at a process level, what is it that's going on? So we, we don't know uh, the processes that are underlying visual story understanding or story understanding more generally. Um, and to revisit kind of the main points, AI and story psychology by themselves are painting incomplete pictures, but if we bring them together and develop cognitively plausible structural models, we may actually be able to epistemologically explain a lot more than what we currently can. And with that, I will uh, stop and take questions. Thanks, everyone. I believe Adam, I, I don't know what happened. All right. <laughs> yeah, so sound, sounds back. Um, so a few questions. Uh, I'll just go through in, in sequence because I think we can get through them all. Uh, Ken Forbes is asking if there's an implementation and if so, if it's been tested on uh, what platforms it's been tested on. Um, so there is an implementation. It's linked in the paper. There, it, it was implemented in uh, TypeScript. Um, so you can actually run it in the browser if you'd like. Um, the question of has it been tested on systems, what does that mean? As in, has it been tested with people or has it been tested, I guess, just in terms of processing capability? I'm not sure. My, my guess is it's referring to like platforms, whether it's uh, uh, tablets. I'm just inferring from the context. I don't actually know. Uh, he's, and, he, and he's just typed in breadth of examples. So, you know, what has it been tested on? Maybe if you could just give some examples. Oh yeah, no. So none. So we're, we're proceeding uh, purely through abductive reasoning here and trying to say, well, okay, what is the minimal thing that we can do by just representing this comic? Um, and clearly we have a lot to go, you know, a lot, a lot of the way to go. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, next questions from uh, Matt Clank. Um, how do you do segmentation? If each panel is an observation, how do you determine the number of events? In the example, it was viewed as a single event. The, uh, in the example, it was viewed as a single event. Ah, right. So here, the this is a great question because the the the, the answer is you can predict with a high degree of certainty what will contribute to event segmentation. And so there's a process model called um, the fluid events model by Radbansky and colleagues at Notre Dame that basically has just a giant uh, decision tree that tells you if this happens when processing, then you know, it, it adds evidence that you, know, you might exhibit a shift and, and you might exhibit an, an event shift that will basically segment a, a new event. Um, and we haven't actually reconciled our, our approach with that model. With comics in particular, the suggestion is that by virtue of you depicting different panels, that the event 
is what comes in between to explain the shift in states. So if you think about each panel as basically a window to the world state, then the events that transform world states are thought as the events that are presented inside the mind of, of the story consumer. But I mean, that is a, a hypothesis that would have to be tested as well. All right, thanks, Rogelio. Uh, I'm afraid that's all the time we have for questions. 